Welcome. I'm David Levi Strauss, chair of the MFA program in art writing here at the School of Visual Arts. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is the first Quixote talk of the spring term on February 14th. We'll have our own Jennifer Krasinski here in conversation with A.S. Hamra about his new book from N Plus One, The Earth Dies Streaming, film writing 2002 to 2018, and much more to come. Also, um, on Thursday, February 7th at 6.30 here, we have the relaunch of our online journal degree critical with readings, music, and a party. You're all invited. But tonight we're thrilled to have Jennifer Kabat with us. Jen was introduced to me by Jennifer Krasinski as a brilliant writer and teacher. And when Jennifer Krasinski tells me things like that, I listen. So I read a number of things. Um, and she's going to be joining our faculty next fall. Yeah. Jen's journalism and criticism have appeared in publications from the Financial Times to The Guardian, Wired, Wallpaper, Freeze, New York, Salon, and Metropolis, where she's a contributing editor. She did graduate work in art history at Columbia and attended the Whitney ISP. In 2003, she received a MA or MFA? It's actually an MA in the UK. It was always give MFA. Ah, <laughs> in creative writing from the University of East Anglia. Jen writes well in a number of different categories of writing, but something she said about one particular category struck me. She said, I love the essay form with an unbridled passion. I think essays offer a power and possibility missing in the novel now, not because essays purport to offer truth, more that I feel a bit stuck with novels, even while I continue to write fiction. Right now, and this is really a statement of this moment versus some hard and fast rule, I'm interested in the hybrid possibilities of the essay. So that certainly makes her one of us. One of the things I read was called The Digital Blues that McSweeney's just published in their End of Trust issue. And Jen described to me initially as a quest to understand the color blue on screen. But it's much more than that, as you're about to find out. Please welcome Jen Kabat. Before I start, I just want to say I am so excited to start teaching here. Like, it's like one of those fairy tale things. I've had a long crush on this department. It was one of the places where I was like, damn, can I go back to grad school? Wait, I've already done an MA in art history, and I have this MA that's like an MFA in creative writing, and then there was the Whitney program. I don't think I can go back to grad school. And so when Levi got in touch with me, I was like, yay. Um, so I'm so, so tickled and totally excited to be um, reading for you tonight. Um, and I'm probably bending slightly weirdly over this microphone, so I'm going to try not to bend weirdly. Um, and I'm going to read um, an essay called The Digital Blues. And I have truncated parts of it and left out some parts entirely. Um, if you want to see the whole thing, the EFF, which is the Electronic Frontier Foundation, actually was the consulting editors with McSweeney's on this. And they have published it under Creative Commons, so you can actually find the essay. It's pretty easy to get. Um, and with that, I just wanted to show you, um, the essay kind of began with this uh, Bierstadt painting, which I really hate. I would say I really expletively hate it. It's in the Met. Um, and I live in upstate New York, and I've been spending a lot of time thinking about Hudson River School paintings and their skies. And this was the first one done out west, and I was like hating this. And so I was thinking about the skies in these paintings, which are very blue, and I was thinking about drones. So that was what I was writing about as I got to this. And then, so I have to like gook, kind of cockeyed here to do this. I got to these blues from there, which kind of gets us into the digital blues. On a beach as a teenager, the artist Eve Klein and two friends decided, like Greek gods, to divide up the realms. 
One got the sea, another the earth, and Klein the sky. Here by the Mediterranean shores, he complained about the gulls stealing his vision, tearing through the azure overhead. I began to feel hatred, he wrote later, for the birds which flew back and forth across my blue sky, cloudless sky, because they tried to bore holes in my greatest and most beautiful work. Soon the sky became his domain. He went on to trademark a shade of blue. International Klein Blue was modeled on lapis lazuli. In 1957, which was four years before this photo, he declared that we'd entered the Epoque Blue, the Blue Age. I think of him now, claiming the sky, hating the birds, calling that blue above his best work, as I consider different skies, different blues, different realms. These two are divvied up and doled out. They appear on the internet and are in our computers and phones, where blue is the most common color, as if that blue, the epoch blue, has only just dawned. I started pondering this blue age as an accident. I stared at my screen, a proverbial window, facing an actual window as I stood at my desk. I was writing, hence easily distracted. I noticed the icons for different apps lined up in the dock, as Apple calls it. Scrolling left to right, there was Finder's square smiley face, a cubist rendering in two blues, the face split like Picasso's demoiselle, shrunk to a half inch square. The App Store, iChat, Mail, and Safari veered close to Klein's luminescent lapis. Microsoft Word was turquoise with shadows in the folds of the W, as if to trick me into believing it had dimensionality. And the few apps that were white or gray took on a blue cast from the LED screen. On the document I wrote, the formatting was blue, the margins marked in blue. An hour later, I started an email, and the recipient's names came in two different blues, a pale one indicating the two-line wall as I typed the email address. Mail helpfully offered a list of names in Navy to jog my memory. And online, links were blue. I returned to my writing, but couldn't escape the blues. I highlighted text to delete it and start my sentence over, and this, too, was the same aching blue of a winter sky in the Catskills where I live. I tried to work, told myself not to think of these hues, but the blues, they did something to me. I couldn't shake them. It was the spring of my mother's death, and research was the only thing that soothed me, as if getting lost in ideas was my salvation. Perhaps my blue was one of sadness, though I hate it when emotions are attached to the color, as if that might explain its grip. Blue held me in its sway, though, all the seasons from spring to summer to fall and the following spring again. Someone told me this ether of screens that could suck up attention was called the blue nowhere. I googled the phrase, and the results turned up in blue. It's the name of a thriller by Jeffrey Deaver. I did not want to share his blues. Still, the shade I saw was foreboding, the gathering dark as the sky settled to night. Another artist, Derek Jarman, equated blue with death and loss his own death and loss. In 1993, he made a film titled simply Blue. The movie is one uninterrupted royal shade, one royal blue shade for 80 minutes. He'd partially lost his vision to complications from AIDS, and the vision he had left was tinged by the movie's color. In it, Tibetan bells chime and voices speak. There's ambient sound from a world he was losing. Streets, cafes, doctor's offices. The experience is intensely intimate as the screen is reduced to a single field of vision. Blue transcends, Jarman's rich voice and tones, the solemn geography of human limits. Blue had been his final film, and I watched it too on YouTube. It had more than 104,000 views with 463 thumbs up and 11 down. I clicked a thumbs up, and it too, was blue. I was convinced that something more lurked in the shades, something perhaps prophetic. On screen, they beckoned and also seemed to hope I might miss them entirely, which seemed to be the point of blue, to appear and disappear as if it were the color of nothing and everything. The color might just be a bit of digital detritus or marketing. 
What was the difference, after all, between these virtual blues and the ones in the real world, where the color dominated corporate logos and those of major league baseball teams? This blue, this sky, this green is window, has a nearly universal reach thanks to computers. The colors, however, come largely from one small sliver of the world's population, in one small sliver of the world on the west coast of the US. Those facts of place and people started to seem prophetic too. Friendship is blue and our language for images is watery. They come in streams, torrents, and floods. We have an image stream, video streams, and on the iPhone, a photo stream. Even that doc where the apps line up so they're easier to find, suggests that the programs are moored boats waiting to take out on the water. Meanwhile, our data is in the sky, in the cloud. We have clouds and currents, streams, skies, and windows, and blue. The internet dates to the late 60s and the Cold War. Developed by an agency of the Defense Department called DARPA, the idea had been to link computers in case of war, but also to connect universities and knowledge and ideas. Knowledge, war, freedom, and information had been at the internet's heart. Technology is never neutral. It always bears out the biases of its moment. This was why I wanted to examine blue, to slow down enough over something that might seem insignificant. The color would have been easy to ignore, yet it now literally underlines our maps and paths of the world with highlighting and links as the color extends our ideas, networks, and commerce. The internet is our new civic realm, and it has shaped our interactions. And here was a color that had become intrinsic to them. Facebook's thumb, sticking up in a shade of dusty indigo, nagged at me, as did the news about LED screens. Meant to mimic daylight, LEDs steal sleep, creating problems with memory and insomnia. Cancer is blamed on this blue light, and death was inflecting my worries, though I didn't blame blue for these hazards. Instead, it was the value smuggled in with the color. British pollsters YouGov undertook a survey in 2015 and claimed blue is the world's most popular color, picked nearly twice as often as the nearest competitor by respondents from Britain to China, Malaysia, Thailand, and beyond. Of course, the survey was online. The internet age, our blue era, is so short that it's possible to see the history unfold before our eyes. Facebook is just a decade and a half old, so maybe it was also possible to untangle blue's meaning before it congealed into accepted norms. Eve Klein had made blue his quest, seeking something spiritual in the color. Achieving it had been a struggle since the Renaissance. The shade had required binders that diluted the intensity, and the color, ultramarine, was expensive. Lapis lazuli, from which it's made, came from a remote region of Afghanistan. The pigment's price had been as stable as an ounce of gold, and until a synthetic blue was created in the early 19th century, only the richest patrons could afford it. Maybe what we were witnessing was the same migration that happened to other colors and pigments, with trade across borders and markets, Ultramarine had moved west and north with the Crusades to Europe, and cochineal, a rich crimson made from crushed beetles in the Americas, became a valuable commodity in the 16th and 17th centuries. It had changed the taste of Europe's wealthy and eventually returned to the Americas in the red coats of the British Army. I remembered hearing a story on NPR about blue and global politics. Online, I found the segment and listened again as the Morning Edition host asked what the color blue meant to me. Is it sad, she said, or soothing, trustworthy, or cold? The burr of her voice reverberated, and in her list were hints of how people perceived the color. Her sentence arced up at the end of her introduction to tell me that in Ethiopia, blue was now the color of resistance. A reporter, a man in Addis Ababa, explained it was the name for the opposition blue party, chosen because it was the color of freedom in Twitter and Facebook. Social media was still uncensored in the country. His comments were all the proof I needed that blue bore symbolic values which we were exporting. I listened to the NPR story over and over and over. The eager journalist was always bright and cheery as he reported on a woman's blue pedicure and got around to blue being the color of social media. 
It took hearing the segment a half dozen times to realize the American reporter had been the only one suggesting it was the opposition party's color because of social media. It was just him and I conflating color and cause. No one he interviewed did. The Blue Party spokesperson gave the reason as the Blue Nile and the Red Sea, which appeared turquoise. Each time the NPR announcer asked if Blue made me sad, her voice settled in my chest, and I thought of my father. He'd written to Adlai Stevenson the day after Stevenson lost his first presidential bid. I found a blue carbon copy of the letter in my mom's files. My dad was 26 and wrote that he was scared of war and of returning to active duty. At the time, he managed a tiny electric co-op in upstate New York, and he worried, too, that the state would privatize its big power projects on the St. Lawrence River. He believed these resources belonged to the public. He believed in the public good, not privatizing infrastructure. And this was the thing with Blue. I was sure it was bound up with privatizing something that should be a public resource. I called the designer Jessica Helfand. She taught a class at Yale on the cultural history of Blue. Yale's color is blue, and she told me a story of the day Twitter launched. She'd been at a design conference where a Twitter spokesperson introduced this little bird, the bluebird of happiness. It was a jaunty aqua, and she thought of the whole thing ridiculous. Typing 140 character messages, she said. Jessica also offered up a story of Paul Rand, as if by example. The legendary designer had created logos for IBM and ABC and turned to American Express and, turn, and tried to turn American Express a teal nearly the color of Tiffany's. It wasn't exactly Tiffany blue, she related, but this was before the digital age, so people couldn't track down your hexadecimal code and say, you stole my swatch. He was alluding to the very bright shade of robin's egg blue and felt that he was psychologically importing the value proposition. It was the color of money. It said wealth. It said exclusive. He was borrowing the cumulative cultural legacy of that memory. She also hinted that he'd stepped very close to the line between borrowing and maybe something more. And perhaps this was blue, borrowing a legacy and bordering on theft. Maybe all these logos were just built on the colors, previous uses, and the myriad values we think blue has, from sadness to freedom and peace and money. Amex now comes in two blues, one darker, a serious navy shade, the other lighter and closer to Tiffany's. Skype and Twitter use a similar hue. Skype's is in the shape of a cloud, Twitter's the bird, and Jessica said, Blue is the path of least resistance. These blue brands, she told me, aren't worthy of your efforts. They're just tamped down consensus building. I could feel her telling me to give up my quest. She said I was a dog with a bone. A blue bone, I joked, or blue blood. The color might be easy to shrug off, but that's why I wasn't going to. A friend at Apple, who couldn't legally discuss with me the blues like Mail or Safari or even Finder that his company had created, sent me to another creative director, Aki Shelton, who used to work at the company. And connected by Skype's Cyan Cloud, she told me about working for a design agency in Japan. One of her clients was a bank in Taiwan. In Japan, she said, blue never had negative connotations. But for the bank, I was making a logo mark, and it was blue. A sky blue they called dead man's face blue, as if it were the color of death. She explained that in China and Taiwan, people take the fact that red and gold represent good luck very seriously. She had, though, been thinking of a different meaning for the color. In the US and UK, it's trustworthy and friendly, safe and modern. All these make it popular. Healthcare companies and health insurance providers are blue. She leaned towards her screen and towards me and said another thing about blue. It recedes. This was why paintings used blue to convey distance. With atmospheric perspective, contrast decreased, and everything blended into the background color, blue most often. When looking at Facebook, she said, that blue basically disappears. Facebook is about users' content and photos. They should stand out so the color should step back and social media uses blue for that reason. 
The color disappears. Blue is the color you don't see, the color of neutrality, but also safety and trust. Perhaps because blue is so ubiquitous, it can represent all of them or nothing, just neutral space. Perhaps blue can represent those values because it's so common it's invisible. At the same time, I think its familiarity renders it trustworthy and reassuring. We see the color so often, it doesn't jar us. Blue is comfortable. Anytime anyone told me blue was the color of something, of say trust or peace or calm, I got suspicious. I'd wanted to tell the NPR host that yes, I was sad, but it had nothing to do with color. Color as feelings seemed too facile, like the results from an online psych quiz. A creative director from ABC News, who had been in charge of its digital platform, told me blue was authority. It was why news outlets used it. She also mentioned that red couldn't be rendered well on screens until recently. You couldn't reproduce it without bleeding. It had been too hard to control until the new retinal displays were developed. Social networks have built on the legacy of blue, she explained, on the trust from news organizations. Like Rand, they had been borrowing or stealing associations. So red was tricky, blue, trust and authority, and credit cards and commerce, news outlets and technology are all using a color to represent these ideals. There's something unnerving about the way the notion of trust, and specifically what news organizations and tech companies and financial institutions consider trust, is derived from simple consensus building that can be summed up in a color. The feedback loop reinforces blue's ubiquity, so we see it more and more, become more and more accustomed to it, and that repetition translates into trust. We don't have to work to understand blue. Perhaps what disturbs me more is how this twinning of trust and authority connects to the ease of consumption. Blue serves as shorthand, a signal of trust, thus the news story is easier to consume, the social media platform more familiar and hence more trustworthy. The more comfortable we feel, the more likely we are to put our trust, our data, our political decisions into a site. Companies seem to think that all we need to trust something is to be shown it repeatedly, no matter its actual relation to fact or security. My husband, a graphic designer, overheard these conversations. He'd been listening to them for months and finally told me he thought the blues weren't about feelings or abstract ideals, but how colors work on screens. The blues came, he suspected, from the web safe color palette. It was a name I'd not heard for a decade. The palette had been a set of colors for the internet that could be reliably reproduced on both Macs and PCs. Both systems could display their own set of 256 shades, but they had 216 of them in common, which were deemed trustworthy or safe. Of these, 22 were truly reliable. Stray from them and specify a different color, he explained, and it would do the. Sorry, you're gonna get a British accent from my husband. It doesn't sound like his voice at all, but you know, I'm just trying. <laughs> so dithering. That is the hatched pattern of visual noise combining two different shades like red and yellow to approximate the one you made, you, you were choosing. So he pulled up on screen for me the color palette and the hues were garish, acid lime greens and yellows, purples that veered to neon. On a hike that summer, I was still harping on about blue. The hills and trees were lush and green, ferns brushed our legs, and we climbed to a fire tower to see the atmospheric blue scattering light and creating distance that blue Aki had talked about. Before we reached the top, my husband said that the web safe color palette had always looked random to him. There was no logic to it. It didn't conform to nature or skin tones. The colors would go from really saturated to really dark, none of which was helpful as a designer. It was a cube of colors that was mathematically derived, so they didn't correspond to nature, and in a way, that is amazing. What he meant was that it wasn't biased towards skin tones. Unlike technologies like printing that when aiming to recreate flesh colors skewed white with an, implied race, with an implicit racism. He hoisted his backpack. But the palette was designed to depict every physical color within 216 mathematical divisions. So it was perfectly inhuman, 
but it also meant there were few attractive colors. And we often would try to find clever ways to make our own, creating our own dithered patterns of stripes and hatches to modify a shade. Or he was blue. The WebSafe color palette was created for Netscape Navigator, the first commercial browser. There we go. We're going to get there in a second. It launched at the end of 1994, its logo the aqua of the North Atlantic. And the company's first press release declared that Netscape would sponsor the altruistic free flow of information and money. Making Netscape freely available to internet users is Mosaic Communications' way of contributing to the explosive growth of innovative information technologies on global networks, said Mark Andreessen, the company's VP of technology, more than two decades ago. He was 23 and had recently graduated from the University of Illinois, where he co-created Mosaic, the first popular web browser. It had been funded by the government, and when he made it, there had been only 26 websites worldwide. He moved to California and started Mosaic Communications to create a commercial browser, Netscape. We expect Netscape's eve of ease of use to lay the foundation for commerce on the net, his statement continued. By the time it was available that December, the browser was no longer free. Not even a half year later, Bill Gates pronounced in an internal memo, now I assign the internet the highest level of importance. <laughs> Up to that point, Microsoft had only had six people working on browsers. After Gates's memo, the company went on a hiring spree and soon my friend Matt became part of the multitude working on the internet at Microsoft. We met around that time, a year or so after he'd started at the company. The internet had been hailed as a utopia where we express ourselves, but it was also a realm of competition and capital Andreessen later wrote for the Wall Street Journal about how software companies working online invade and overturn and disrupt to become the dominant force. I thought of that invasion with Gates's intense desire to own the internet. Microsoft Windows 95 launched in August 1995, and the software soon came bundled with Microsoft's own web browser, Internet Explorer. Its early versions were identified by a blue marble of the earth over which hung a tiny magnifying glass. That earth was quickly replaced with a lowercase cerulean E. Microsoft's Internet Explorer had become the earth. Microsoft's browser killed off Netscape. In what may have been the biggest irony, Microsoft licensed Andreessen's first browser, Mosaic, in order to jump quickly into the browser market and then poured millions into starting a browser war. Internet Explorer was essentially mosaic, and it was pitted against Netscape, which never recovered. Meanwhile, Internet Explorer, with its little blue E, took over the world. And perhaps it was this blue, the globe, the marble of the earth, that became a brand that killed off the competition and tried to dominate what and how we see. In the fall, Matt and I met at a cafe in Soho. We sat outside, and he had recently quit his job for Ace Hotels. Our breath puffed in large clouds, and on his lap was a tiny dog named Biggie with the face of Yoda. Matt had started at Microsoft soon after he'd graduated from RISD. He said back then Microsoft was hiring everyone to keep them away from the competition. The Tetris guy who invented the game, they paid him not to work for anyone else. And Brian Eno, he got $35,000 for the three notes you'd hear when you booted up Windows. Microsoft launched MSN, the Microsoft Network, as its version of AOL. And Matt created a youth culture zine for it called Mint. We had this idea, he said, that we'd reverse the logo. The brand people, they came in and said no, so we asked again. In all this, we were being lectured about the brand guidelines and what they meant and why. They said the brand had to be blue because blue was the most popular color. He shook his head. The moment stuck with him for more than two decades. Blue, he repeated wistfully, was the world's most popular color. Another friend, I have to tell you, another bad British accent is coming your way. He's also <laughs> British, who'd worked at, a, at Microsoft's ad agency on the launch of Windows 95, concurred. 
The blue hadn't been about beauty or function. The reasoning hadn't even been as good as its packaging. Blue skies, open windows, and freedom, it was reductive. Everything at Microsoft was data-driven, he explained. They'd give you three options and ask which one you preferred. They didn't make decisions, they responded to data points. This agency employee, my friend, he didn't want his name quoted. He still works in advertising, still works for tech companies, and said, Microsoft used quantitative research testing delivered by companies that link the data to pre-existing normative data in order to predict the values. It's an egregious misuse of data. Essentially, Microsoft was making decisions on data that other companies collected and analyzed. My friend linked this back to Robert McNamara, the Ford executive who'd made design and manufacturing decisions based on data, and how McNamara used these data-driven decision-making processes to measure success in Vietnam when he became Secretary of Defense. By 19 whatever it was, McNamara's data and his much vaunted computers in California had models saying we were six months away from exterminating every Vietnamese human being. My friend swallowed a bitter laugh. In World War II, McNamara's statistics were responsible for decisions to firebomb civilians in Japan, and they turned Vietnam into war by body count. In both cases, numbers were supposed to rationalize war, making it logical. Instead, they dehumanized everyone. Soldiers became nothing more than killing machines. Their statistics were reported weekly in US newspapers. While he was Secretary of Defense, McNamara's data was often so complex, it was impossible to contradict. It built a wall around his decisions. No one could question it, and the statistics seemed to remove human fallibility. My friend said it showed how wrong data can be. At best, you get blue, you get algorithms making decisions. The thing is though, technology is not created in a vacuum, but by humans, repeating our biases, our prejudices. The algorithms deployed by companies like Google or Facebook allow for only a seeming objectivity. And when a company trots out claims of objectivity, it cloaks them in a color, blue, to reinforce that image. Blue is the richest color for me, Mark Zuckerberg told The New Yorker when his company was going public. I can see all of blue. And according to Zuckerberg, this was why Facebook is blue. In 2004, when he was launching the social network, its first logo was blue on blue. He paired a denim shade with Eve Klein's bold one. The network's name was the Facebook, which appeared wrapped in brackets as if a whisper or an aside. The site was just that at first, accessible only to students at Harvard and a few other elite universities. He'd likely chosen blue because he was colorblind, something he discovered only years later in a test online. Like him, about 8% of men with Northern European ancestry have red-green colorblindness. Okay, I'm gonna actually skip up here a tiny bit. Um, so this idea of seeing and vision and the eye became sort of what I started to look for at this point. I was thinking that blue might be about vision. So my knowledge of vision ends basically in high school where I learned that there are three ways of seeing with cones in the eye. We have red, green, and blue, and then the cones work to, work to kind of trick the eye into perceiving multiple shades. Now, there's only one problem with the science that dates to about 1801. So I was teaching at the time at NYU, which is a research university, and I tracked down a couple professors who had worked with DARPA as well as Disney. And as one of them said, the three-letter agencies, which would be like the NSA. So DARPA was responsible for the internet, and Disney has long used color to play on our emotions. And I thought, voila, my answer. So, they were on this quest for better color that DARPA had sent them on to make better screens and displays. And they were on this quest, not because DARPA wants us to watch better TV or anything like that, but for better spying, because they needed better resolution to watch spy uh, footage, basically. And that sent them on a global quest to understand vision to try and get to a better resolution for better spying. And it came down to this, and I'm gonna quote one of these two guys. 
Um, the eye, he explained, has a vitreous fluid. It's an ultraviolet filter to protect the eye and also a blue diffuser. It causes the blue to be diffused so the rods detect it. We've got 20 million rods in the eye, by the way, processing blue and they can't do anything but process blue. And then we've got all these cones and they're trying to read detail and do color definition and chromatic separation so that we can perceive these precise changes in color. But blue is really easy to process. So basically, if I'm gonna believe him, and I have to say, in all honesty, their science conflicts with other science around vision, and I am totally not a scientist, as you might have guessed. But if I believe them, blue is easy on the eye and it is literally in the eye of the beholder. Only this is a problem for me because blue didn't always exist, certainly not as we know it. So if there's no word for something, can you see it? Is there a hole in perception or experience? How do we frame that thing or describe it? And this is my problem with blue. It hadn't always been around, or at least there hadn't always been a word for it. Linguists, anthro anthropologists, and ethnologists have been fighting over this for nearly 50 years. Language shapes how we see. It lays out the common currency of our world. Words exist because we communally agree we need them and their meanings. So if we can't talk about something together, what then? Do we talk around it? The Odyssey famously has no mention of blue anywhere in the book. It might be an epic about sailing over the Aegean, but for Homer, the sea was wine dark. The African Himba tribe also has no word for blue, but many greens. Well, Russian has two distinct words for blue. Light blue is goluboy, and dark blue, sinij. And the modifiers light and dark might make them seem related to an English speaker. But goluboy and sinij are akin to red and yellow, two entirely different colors. In 2006, a group of scientists in Boston studied how the two words shaped perception, testing native English speakers and native Russian speakers on these blues. The volunteers had to identify different blue squares on a screen. The ones who'd grown up with Goluboy, the Russian speakers, were faster than the English speakers at identifying the differences. In a friend's house upstate, I conducted my own study. Alina is Ukrainian and Jeff is Russian and they are both artists. He leaned against the desk and said, the blues from Gullaboy to Sinej were not at all that different, even if the words were. The colors are such a continuum, I can't really fix what is light blue. It goes from the lightest of light shades, which are almost white, all the way to black, basically as Sinej. So when you say light blue Gullaboy, it's just a point on an infinite line. What about mixing colors, I said, learning to paint? You add more white or more water, Alina explained to me. The blues, they mix just the same. How would they learn them as children? She couldn't remember. Jeff said, the sky is gullaboy with tints of gray and greens. Dark blue is the color of the ocean or the night sky. We were speaking in English of a Russian blue. Already the language was slipping and I wanted to track down that untranslatable place to understand it in Russian not Russian rendered into English. There was a hole in our blues. I didn't see the ocean as dark like Jeff and Alina did. For me, it was turquoise. And maybe that difference in language shifted how we saw color. Blue came to English from the Norse, from blay, a word that meant blue-black. It was connected to death and lividity, migrating from early German as blah, to Romance languages via the barbarians, and for years the color was associated with heathens. In Northern England and Scotland, they had blue and versions of the original blah as B-L-A-E and B-L-A-Y. Not blue, it was more blah, almost as I would picture it, a dull, sunless day. A friend in China wrote to tell me that in Chinese culture, a color stemmed from the five elements and blue wasn't one of them. The color associated with water, he emailed, think winter, stillness, etc., is black, not blue. Blah, black, blue, wine dark. Okay, I am now skipping over an entire section. So you'll just have to read the original essay. In San Francisco in early spring, I went in search of one Eve Klein. It was tiny, just bigger than an app icon. Its owner was the artist Lynn Hirschman Leeson. 
She's worked with interaction, technology, and privacy since the 1970s. Her difference engine used an early robotic interface, and in the mid-90s, she created telerobotic dolls with webcams for eyes that gallery visitors controlled. Online, you could see what the dolls saw, a prescient example of internet surveillance. We sat in an Italian restaurant in North Beach, and she promised to bring the painting. It's the size of a stamp she said on the phone, but it still has that special power of that Eve Klein blue. I wanted to ask where the Klein was before any pleasantries. Sparkling water, bread, and olive oil all materialized on the table, and I wondered how she might produce the painting. All she had was a purse. She reached for her bag and pulled out a gold rectangle, the frame. My heart leapt. Okay, just an apology. This is a photo that Lynn took later and sent to me, and I told her it could be a crappy image. I just needed to see it for reference, so you're not supposed to see this, but you are. So my heart leapt. No tissue or bubble wrap protected the painting. The only thing between the Eve Klein and me was a tiny sliver of glass. The painting was luminous, and I could call the blue royal or French, but describing it would diminish its power. The painting did light up our table, just as Lynn had promised. It even had serrated edges like a stamp. Its size doesn't matter, she said. It has this internal essence. For him, there was this mysticism, this floating sense of being erased in blue. I had been waiting months to see the painting, and here we were with it in a restaurant of all places. I cradled the frame, and Klein's blue pigment saturated my space. I didn't want her to put it away, but I couldn't hold on to it forever. I'd been in the Bay Area for a month at a residency on a former military base, thinking about the language of Silicon Valley, freedom, individualism, and creativity. I told Lynn I'd been writing about Jack Dorsey, Twitter's founder, libertarianism and Twitter's blue bird. It trumpets free language. Meanwhile, Dorsey's other invention, Square, processes mobile payments, making commerce ever more free and ethereal. She slid the painting back into her purse and stowed it on the floor. There was an Eve Klein at my feet and now a beet salad before me. If I bent awkwardly to the side, I could see a hint of the frame. I explained to her how my quest had been going wrong. I was losing hope, and I said that I'd also been mourning my parents, and maybe thinking about Blue had helped me deal with those emotions. Lynn talked about Derek Jarman and asked if I'd seen his Blue, that it would make sense given my grief. I was ashamed to admit I'd seen it online. She told me I was not crazy for spending all of this time on the color and said that the smallness of the search made it worthwhile as I dug into the values behind the shade. She linked blue to chroma key, to blue screens, the first technology for special effects. It was, she said, originally blue, a little darker than Twitter. This blue allowed things to appear and disappear so someone could be anywhere in the world. With blue, she said, I always think of the reasons Klein chose the color, spiritualism and the atmosphere and our sky. With technology, there are global issues, ideas growing through the air and ether and air represented by sky and blue and that connectivity. My hope is that the founders of digital media, who were mainly hippies working in garages in the 60s and 70s, were also thinking this way, like Eve Klein, using blue as a method of infusing a global, spiritual sensibility into technology. She lived in Berkeley then, too. It was a moment, she said, of opening up to the individual, and technology has always been in the fault lines here. TV wasn't invented here. She added that if she hadn't lived in the Bay Area, she doubted she'd have focused on technology in her own art. Place, she said, shaped the ideas formed there. Lynn's projects consider the dark ways technology identifies us. And she told a story of meeting developers in the early 80s who were working on interactive technology. They talked of how it would track our interests to sell us things. She kept nervously anticipating its release, only the development arrived years later than she expected. When we left the restaurant, the sky was still bold and vibrant, and I thought of this blue of ether, of disappearance and tracking and surveillance. Blue had driven me crazy, 
and Eve Klein had trademarked the blue of his sky so no one else could claim it. Yet it was here before me on a bright afternoon in a city that shaped the tech industry. I called Rob Janoff, one of those hippies Lynn had talked about. He designed Apple's rainbow striped logo in 1976. He's a friend's father, I'd known him for years, and he explained too how those values of openness, freedom, and revolution had been part of the early computer era. They were why he made that rainbow logo. He added one last thing about blue. It veers to black, like gathering dusk outside. It was the same dark hue I'd seen in the color as I set out on my search, and maybe also the hue of Homer's wine dark shade. Apple's first logo, though, wasn't Rob's. For nearly a year, the company had used something that looked like a Durer etching. <laughs> it was Newton reading under an apple tree as a piece of fruit threatened to fall on his head. A legend at the bottom declared, Newton, <laughs> the legend, Newton, a mind forever voyaging through strange seas, alone. Somehow that seemed fitting tying back to water, but also, in a sense, to color. In the 1660s, Newton had been the first to refract light through a prism to get the spectrum. He identified it as having seven colors, including blue, indigo, and violet. Indigo was later dropped from the list. It was thought he'd only included the shade to make up the number seven, which was rich with symbolism. Stuart Brand was another of the Berkeley hippies who saw possibility, peace, and freedom uniting in computers. He created the Whole Earth Catalog in 1968. Not a catalog at all, it didn't sell anything, but reviewed tools and technology. Brand's guiding ethos was empowering people through information. In the first edition, he wrote that governments and industries with their top-down bureaucratic ways had failed. Instead, he said, a realm of intimate personal power is developing, power of the individual to conduct his own education, find his own inspiration, shape his own environment, and share his adventure with whoever is interested. The Whole Earth Catalog aimed to provide what the internet would promise decades later, and Brand saw all the hope that free information could conjure. Nearly 30 years later, Steve Jobs compared the Whole Earth Catalog to Google in a commencement speech at Stanford. In the 60s, Brand had also campaigned for NASA to release the first image of Earth from space. The Whole Earth, he'd called it. And that image of the globe as a tiny marble appeared on the catalog's covers. The same year the catalog launched, Brand attended what's now called the mother of all demos where the first working prototype of a computer as we know it was displayed by Douglas, Douglas Engelbart. It had a graphic interface, mouse, windows, hypertext, even video conferencing. Brand helped at the launch. In 1985, before the first web page had been created, Brand went on to co-found The Well, one of the first virtual communities in the US. Its members even coined the phrase virtual community. Standing for Whole Earth Electronic Link, well, also had a utopian hippie feel, as if it were embracing the future with free information and a communitarian spirit. I remember living in New York in the early 90s and being jealous of how the well created a sense of a shared new world for its members. And the logo was the name in all caps except the E. It was lowercase, as Microsoft Explorers would later be, with a swirling circle at the center like a whirlpool or perhaps the globe. I thought now of how ideas could be linked to a place as Lynn described. Here had been a new focus on the individual in the most optimistic sense. The whole earth, the globe, the well, these images of water, those blues that shaped the early internet came from brand. So too did the saying, information wants to be free. He said it in the mid 80s, when the internet as we know it did not exist. And when he said free, he was talking about money. He was talking about how distributing information was getting cheaper and cheaper, and his original statement was much longer than the soundbite it's been reduced to. By the early 2000s, that soundbite had evolved into the clarion call for an open internet with universal access. The idea of free information is also one with no boundaries. It's easy to slip from openness to neoliberalism, where that goal of openness is misinterpreted into a laissez-faire system with no protections for users. 
where businesses, particularly ones online, can conflate the communitarian urge for an open and free internet available to all with the free, unregulated flow of money. It's a quick slip of language for social media moguls who want everyone to have access to their sites while maintaining no responsibilities for what that access entails, all the while searching and selling users' data. I like technology that is unbiased, Jack Dorsey said, but technology has never been unbiased. Today, Mosaics and Netscape Navigator's creator Mark Andreessen embraces libertarian causes. He's on the board of Facebook and runs a venture capital firm, while Mark Zuckerberg, who could see all of blue, campaigns for internet freedom. The freedom he wants is one in which everyone has access to Facebook, and Facebook has access to all those users' information. This Berkeley hippie language is being used by the tech industry to posture as if it's creating a better, purer world. In his congressional testimony about Cambridge Analytica, Zuckerberg talked of his company's social mission and called Facebook idealistic and optimistic. The information he collects, the data and metadata and digital signatures, the things we sign away knowingly and unknowingly, is hardly different from the information the CIA's drone operators use to target terrorism suspects. Only Facebook uses that information to target ads. Back at the military base turned National Park where I'd been writing for the past month. So I hiked up a hill, it was on the edge of the ocean, Waves crashed in the distance, and there was no one nearby. I stood on the bluff and pondered the word alone in the first Apple logo with Newton. Voyaging strange seas alone. Apple had made Engelbart's designs accessible to millions. Today, those innovations are integral to our experiences online. I kept thinking of language and what got secreted into it, and how ideas might resonate over time, haunting our present. The screen had first been called a window in the late 60s, around the time DARPA developed the internet. Now that screen opened onto a new landscape. Eve Klein called his monochromes landscapes of liberty. The sky, the window, hope. Computers were filled with idealism. By the time Netscape Navigator launched, that freedom was tied to commerce, and Lynn saw very quickly that commerce would lead to our being tracked. After Steve Jobs drained all the color from Rob's logo, Jobs moved his company offshore to Ireland to avoid paying taxes, embracing that neoliberal ideal that money could travel without borders. This borderless, unchecked internet was the goal of people like Andreessen and Zuckerberg, and this internet celebrated individualism, even as Zuckerberg often called Facebook a community. I hiked down the hill to a Nike, Nike nuclear missile site there, Nike nuclear missile site that was now a museum. Behind razor wire, the sharp white nose of a missile pointed into the air as if about to launch. The hill was dotted with wildflowers, but once it had been guarded by attack dogs and men with rifles. Nike missiles were installed here in 1954 during the Cold War, and later DARPA would create the internet as a tool for that same war. In World War II, we'd seen the results of totalitarianism, how it shackles the self to the state. Forced conformity had been the near death of civilization as we know it. And afterwards, communism loomed large. Instead, the West embraced the opposite of the communal. Over the next few decades, the individual aloneness had been raised up and become the answer. The individual equaled freedom. It was a liberation ideology of the self. The Cold War became the Vietnam War, and in 1968, Brand was still talking about the individual. In light of the failures of the state and corporations, he saw the individual as the path forward. Free self-expression was to be our salvation, except that with time, freedom transformed into the glut of selfhood splayed out on social media, and all of it came dressed up in blue. It's no, surprising, it's no surprise that Cambridge Analytica got its data from something clothed as a personality test. We're all posting our curated selves online, me included. It's images like these that are given a thumbs up on Facebook. That quest for connection and approval is deeply human, 
Companies exploit that need and render it addictive. And while they might call themselves communities, these platforms prioritize the individual, that curated self, over the group. This is what we're sending out in the world. And by we, I mean the US. And that small corner of the US where companies like Facebook and Google are based. The individual has long been an American ideal. It's the pioneer, the yeoman farmer, the entrepreneur, the pull yourself up by the bootstraps narrative. It's Mark Zuckerberg alone in his dorm room. It is also Donald Trump. The core of capitalism is the individual. It's the basis of Adam Smith's liberalism, which was liberal in that it had no restrictions, believing the market would create them, believing that when everyone acted out of their own self-interest, the appropriate level would be found. As companies have hijacked the idea of a free internet, free only in that it shucks boundaries and regulations, those companies that thrive on advertising dollars get more money. All of this is blue. The blue is freedom, expression, the air, the clouds, the sky, the window onto the world. It is innocuous. It seems unthreatening. It is a landscape of liberty. It is trust and openness. It is also privatization, the good of the individual over the group, rather than the greater civic good. I walked down the bluff to my studio and emailed Brand. His office was nearby, and Lynn suggested I get in touch with him about meeting. Thanks, he responded almost immediately. I have to pass. Five brief words highlighted in blue on my screen. Thank you. Well, I think, because you know, I think all this blue is really, really like white dudes in California, basically. Um, or maybe a few non-white dudes, but it's a very dude culture in California. So I think it comes from that. Like, I actually think that that blue is weirdly kind of lazy. It's like a lazy repetition of stuff um, that gets freighted with all this meaning. And I wish they thought as extensively as like considering how other cultures see blue and its possible meanings. So I don't think they do that at all. Like I think they're really quite closed minded. I think they're I think a lot of them are just relying on bad surveys like blue is the most popular color and like you know like I think that there I think that there are all these values in the color but I don't think that they think deeply about it weirdly yeah did that answer your question I probably didn't but I like that that, that blue could have been for girls at one point and that pink was boys yes well, it was very sweet. The EFF were like, will she please write a whole book on this? And I was like, I think I've exhausted my interest in blue at this point. <laughs> I mean, it did take me like a year and a half of research. That was, at some point, I felt really like it wasn't going to, like I wasn't going to ever get an answer was the thing I was really scared of. And I was so pissed off about the color that I had to keep going. It's, but it's really weird to me because red is actually the color of labor, you know, or Marxism. So I don't understand why the Republicans in this country want to be red and why the Democrats want to be blue. In the United Kingdom, it's the total opposite. Makes more sense there. But I don't know that. Yeah. I, my guess is it's probably fairly recent only because you know, they didn't have color advertising for political campaigns or even color political buttons for a long time. Yeah, but I don't know. But I don't think it's as long standing as the elephant representing Republicans, which is another weird thing. <laughs> or the donkey for the Democrats, for that matter. Yes, or the fact that we even have a two party system, which is really screwed up. <laughs> but that's a whole other issue. <laughs> Anything else? Um, yeah. Levi, do you have any questions about Stuart Brand? Because you know, I, Levi, we were talking on the phone about this or in an email about this. He's like, I think you like Stuart Brand better than I do. And I was like, I don't think I do. I think he's pretty awful. So I just want to clarify, I think Stuart Brand is pretty awful. And he is now head of a group called the Long Now Organization, um, which I also think is pretty lame. Um, and there's this show that was up at the VNA, and I wrote a catalog essay for it. It was on the future. And they had all, and the Long Now has been assembling a, a library of books that we will need for the future. And so, and there were like books that exist that we will need to kind of recreate civilization. 
Um, and I was in the library counting up the books. And basically at that point, they didn't have all the books. So, you know, maybe some apologies to Stuart Brand, but like five were by women and the rest were by men. And this was gonna be a thousand books. So he's on my bad list, <laughs> just, just to clarify. <laughs> Um, I mean, I actually do tie all this kind of neoliberalism and the way the individual has developed as this kind of focus of attention to him. Like, I think he's really one of the large people behind it um, as a kind of social movement. Yeah. Okay. So I just needed to make that clear. In the early version of this, there's a lot about um, Amex and their brand guidelines. Um, as I was researching this, I got somebody who was working for, for Amex's agency in London on digital stuff to read me the brand guidelines about blue, which included their talking about like how blue was overused by banks to represent authority. But, you know, the essay is like 40 some pages long, so I had to cut something. How did I work on this essay? Well, um, the essay really started because I was staring at my computer and I couldn't write, and I couldn't really, um, and I was really like dumbstruck by my the dock and my computer, and how many logos were blue. Like it was just a dumb moment of, uh, you know, writerly distraction. And the Kunsthalle Vienne was doing a show on blue, and they were like, hey, do you wanna write something for the show we're doing on blue? And I was like, well, I'm really obsessed with this color. So I started it then, and I didn't get very far because it took a long time. Like, and I would just like, if I would like met anybody, I would be like, hey, do you know anything about blue on screens? Like, it was really like that. And like one time I was talking to Bridget Donahue, who's like Lynn Hirschman's uh, gallerist. And I was like, hey, do you think Lynn would talk to me? I bet she knows something about blue on screens. And she's like, well, you can try her. And so it was really just asking everybody I could. I'm like, you know, there's a department at NYU called ITP, which stands for something with interactive technology. And I happened to know somebody who knew the head of the department. So I was like, hey, do you have anybody there who would know anything about blue? And he was like, I have the person for you. And so it was this thing where it's like, I kept, it was a little bit like being Ulysses. And like you go to one place and you pick up something that takes you for the next bit of your journey. And I would kind of keep assembling these little pieces until I came to sort of understand what I thought it meant, if that makes sense. Um, but the writing of it, it was like a strange thing that was sort of like shunted off in the sidelines of doing other projects. Um, I think that's it. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, yeah, and please send angry emails to Stuart Brand.